codes. So we are ready. Hi, everybody. Welcome for this new Jenkins infrastructure meeting. Um, the first one after FOSDEM, the good thing is nothing major crashed for FOSDEM. So I'm not sure who put to the agenda FOSDEM results. I'm not sure if it ended up to be in this meeting, but let's see. Let's let's briefly talk about what, that one. Um, I mean, it went great. Um, I follow the Jenkins stands and the CICD dev room. Um, for the Jenkins stance, I think um, there are things that could have been improved um, because we couldn't stream um, demo, so people had to join the, the Jitsi call. But at least for the CI/CD dev room, it went really great. I saw some numbers uh, posted on the web mentioning 33,000 attendees over the weekend. Considering that the first day max attendees number is 8,000, that's a pretty impressive number, um, especially considering um, that was the first time that the, that, the, that the system was used for the first day. And um, then, yeah, that, that, that was a great, great, great weekend. Um, regarding the Jenkins stand, I have the feeling that we had less attendees compared to the previous years. Um, I think it's probably because people had to join the call. So we usually during the first time have people who just show up at the booth just to sew demo, demos, but they don't really want to, to, to how I would say, um, to really engage. Um, and in this case, we could not see those people. So it was really only the people who started discussion. So uh, it's hard to see. It's hard to say from, from my point of view, if it was more attendees or less attendees compared to the previous year. But at least nothing major broke during the during the first time from an infrastructure standpoint. I mean, except that the VPN, but it was not critical for the Jenkins community. So we could do demo and stuff like that. So that was really great. Any question before I continue? No. Sounds good. So let's briefly talk about the VPN outage. So since so Last Wednesday, um, we discovered that the VPN would not work anymore. Um, the incident started after we updated the OpenLDAP Docker image, which was really weird. Um, and so we tried to replicate the issue locally. We identified that the problem was related to some TLS um, TLS issues. So for some reason, we could establish the connection from the LDAP client from the VPN to the LDAP, but we could not use the LDAP plugin used by OpenVPN to establish the connection from the VPN to OpenLDAP. Um, we investigated with Garrett and Damien, um, and what we discovered was the LDAP configuration, I mean, the, the LDAP plugin from OpenVPN was configured to use an old LDAP CA. So previously on OpenLDAP, we were using a specific CA um, from a code ID, I think like that, um, I'm not sure. Then back in June, we switched to Let's Encrypt. And for some reason, um, for some reason, it has been working until now. And then, um, and then it stopped working. So our guess is a default configuration in OpenLDAP refused to, uh, to have connection coming with the wrong uh, CA. Um, but basically we fixed that um, this morning. So now everything is back on track, um, which, is, which is fine. Um, in terms of um, incidents, that was annoying, but not a major issue because we had workarounds and we did not even rely on the infrastructure running inside the VPN. So it was okay to just delay the work on that for a few days. Um, so now we identify improvement for the open VPN so we can easily reproduce the environment locally using Docker Compose file. Um, Damien open a pull request that is, which is already merged containing fixes. So we can use self-signed certificate locally so we can easily replicate um, the production environment. 
a question before I move to the next topic. So the next one that I want to briefly mention, I sent an email on the mailing list this afternoon. Um, I've been monitoring the status of Serverion, the Mirror Serverion. Um, the IP was stable, the DNS record was stable. So I put back that mirror in our infrastructure. Um, I had to remove the configuration and put it back again because for some reason mirror bits would not allow me to update um, the location. It would not detect the new location of the public IP. So I suspect that it only configure um, the location the first time we add the mirror. So removing and re-adding re the mirror correctly, um, um, discover the correct location. Um, so it should be back soon. And if there is anything wrong, uh, then we'll have to investigate. We still have to monitor mirrors. Um, I haven't had the time to open a PR for that. Um, should be a pretty quick fix. Um, <laughs> But yeah. So, so Olivier, the location, do we know where it's declaring itself location-wise now? Is it correctly declaring itself in the Netherlands or is it still yeah, is somewhere it located? in the States? No, if you look at my screen, I'm listing mirrors. Um, and so it's correctly detected in Netherlands. Um, for, for the moment, it detects the mirror as down. Um, but yeah, it should it should come back. So basically, the way the way um, the way mirror bits detect if a node is up or down, it just take a random file and test if that file is located on the mirror. The problem that we have right now is because most of the, I mean because almost every mirrors um, only contain part of the files. Um, if we are testing a very old one, um, it, I mean. It detect the mirror as done, which is not so. Sometimes it can take some time to to add those mirrors to the pool. Um, an improvement would be to configure archives.jenkins.org to be the source of the mirror, so people would download every file. Um, it would simplify mirror bits management, but from an end user point of view, it would change nothing because who cares to download Hudson's Hudson binaries anyway. So archive the Jenkins.io contain every artifact generated under Hudson and the Jenkins project. Um, while yeah, people are just relying on, on new artifacts. So th this will just be um, a quick, I mean, it's not mandatory, but that would be a way to have to, to, to simplify the management of my mirror bits. Unless you have any question, I move to the next topic, which is Jenkins updates. Um, because last week, because of the first time that happened last week, last week I had issues with update CLI as well. And um, we had issues with the VPN. So we have quite a lot of pending PRs to update the various Jenkinses in our infrastructure. Um, so I've been waiting before merging the PRs because when we merge PRs, that, that define which Docker image we use, automatically to restart Jenkins instances. Um, I didn't want to do it today because we had the weekly release today. So both release.ci and trust.ci were affected. Um, I think we have a stable release coming or in the coming days, tomorrow, right? Yes, So tomorrow. we don't, yeah. Yeah, so we so it's definitely not the right time to play with Jenkins updates. So we'll probably wait until Thursday before merging Jenkins PR. I mean, the PRs related to Jenkins. So I just wanted to have some. Um, we could attempt um, to start the two point two sixty three point four build early your day, uh, so that you have. And it's it's only a three or four hour process if I remember right. Then you could have Wednesday afternoon to work in for if you'd like. If we got, but it would mean someone would have to launch that early in the day. To be to be honest, I wouldn't bother for that okay. uh, specific version. So I would just I would just wait Thursday. Um, okay. Um, while we are also talking about the Jenkins, um, I would like to update the EC2 plugin uh, on CI.jenkins.io. 
um, there is one feature that I discovered that I that I was missing from my point of view for a while. Um, on EC2, with the EC2 plugin, we ha we had to specify a specific MI. Um, so each, which means that each time we were building a new MI, we had to manually conf update the Jenkins configuration, which was cumbersome. And so now with the more recent um, version of the EC2 plugin, we can now filter and fetch the latest version. So I would like to use that, which means that we would be using the latest um, we would always use the latest AMI, which is probably not something that we are doing at the moment. But yeah, probably waiting um, until Thursday to be sure that everything is fine before um, putting those services down. Um, then, would, yes. Would, would you be willing to do the up, use that same time to do the upgrade to 2.263.4? That way we just yeah. do do them both, so both upgrade to 263.4 and update EC2? Yes, that sounds good, yeah. Okay, great. The next topic that I, which is about pager duty. So last week I did a demo to Garrett, um, Damien and Cara about how to use pager duty. Um, I realized at that time that I did not have permission to invite people. So basically, something that we would like to do now is um, start using pager duty again. So we'd like to have more people um, in the loop and also fix uh, either incidents or monitoring. So right now, we have few people in the monitoring, um, but they don't necessarily answer. And so we just in your alerts. And the idea would be to, to start using it again. Um, I sent a bunch of invite today. If other people are interested to participate um, in the on-call rotation, basically what we try to do is to only be on call during our, I would say, working hours, um, because we have enough people on different time zone. Um, to look at issues there. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the thing. Um, the, 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 I would say the priority right now is when we get a notification for an issue is to see, to identify if that issue is relevant. Um, if it's not relevant to update the check accordingly, so we don't get notified again. If it's relevant and we don't have the documentation, we try to update the documentation so other people can deal with that issue. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is to add more check um, to, to, to do the way we handle um, pager duty issues. We already have a Git repositories with documentation, so that would be a perfect moment to update that documentation. Next topic. Yep, next topic. Um, I, I leave the floor to Damien, but Damien and Kara have been working on rootless um, GNLP agents. Um, so I, I propose that Damien explain the current status of that work. Mm -hmm. So so uh, the technical work for the initial issue, which was um, having a default user on these Docker images to be something else than the root user. Um, because uh, on different places on the infrastructure, we are using these images. And there were some scenarios where running as root user was, was triggering issue, not mentioning the security concern that could happen especially because we don't run Docker engine as rootless engine as for today. Um, in that context, the technical work has been done by Cara and she took the opportunity to add a um, test harness, which is common for all the images because all the images of, from the GNLP agents repository uh, share the some same uh, expectation in terms of behavior, the same entry point, the same default user, because most of these images are built um, inheriting from the tools installed like Golang or Maven or PowerShell. So they inherit from this tool. And some files or elements are copied or duplicated from the Jenkins inbound agent images. So the jar file, a script. So the resulting image might differ from the inbound agent. 
in terms of behavior or content. This is why Cara have wrote this test harness to be sure that what we expect, the general behavior we expect from all these images is detected really early in the process by, by this testing harness system. Um, so with this, we're able to deliver. However, there is still one blocking concern. It's about the naming. We made a proposal after some discussions about moving the images that were in Jenkins CI namespace in Docker Hub slash GNLP agent. Everyone agree on the renaming of the image name part. So inbound agent instead of GNLP agent following the parent images. But since these images are only known to be used on the Jenkins infrastructure, at least initially, uh, we propose to move it to the Jenkins CI infra namespace so that the existing image not being documented, not being updated as for today should be deprecated and not passed as an artifact to the community. However, the discussion on the mailing list raised the issue that there are some uh, people from the community that are consuming these images. So it looks like there is still an expectation of keeping the Jenkins CI namespace. So we, no decision has been taken. I think the discussion was delayed due to the VPN uh, and the FOSDEM. However, we need to take decision. So the proposal would have been the following. Uh, even it would have been first, we deliver that change for the Jenkins CI infra. So we rename the image, including the move to the Jenkins CI namespace first. And we announce the deprecation of the older image name. Then the idea is we can totally introduce back next month or in the next month is the new Jenkins slash inbound agent dash something. If and only if an image has been documented and there is someone from the community willing to help maintaining it. That's the proposal. So if no one come to maintain these images, then the images won't be provided. And if we don't have anyone, it will just disappear because no one is using it. The goal is to ensure that we have some quality level because providing images that are updated once a year is deserving everyone, us as maintainer, but also the community because they will use this image, keep this image uh, assuming that it will work while it's not. And I don't even mention the security issues because if we pass a security scanning on these images, it will be really, really bad. Some, some things that were triggered in that discussion first, do we really want to provide these images in the sense that we already have different dimension to maintain GDK version, operating system, uh, inbound, outbound agent. And this add another dimension about we want Maven, but do we want to maintain Maven 3 and the incoming Maven 4? Do we want to add two versions of Ruby? Do we want to add different version of Golang as well? What are the depreciation notice? So it depends on upstream tools that have different depreciation and life cycle than ours. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the use cases solved by these images? That's really important. That's also the reason why I propose that we move to the Jenkins CI infra because we know why we use it. And then if the community asks for questions, that means there are people using it, they have interesting use case. And it's important to capture this use case to build the correct artifact for them. Maybe they will need back these images, but we need to be sure to not waste our time there because it's a complex topic in particular around maintenance and updates. Um, some improvement that we see upcoming that might not be prior, but due to this discussion and the work that Cara did, um, adding a specific test harness per image, because the Golang image have some differences from the Maven image in that context. So we need to improve the process um, so that the process is able to build and test images in parallel efficiently with first a common test harness and then a specific test harness by image. Second, um, we see another improvement. It's thinking about all the images we produce on the Jenkins CI, all the agents and even the controller 
and maybe use the CST harness. The goal will be to test half of the features or expected behavior with the CST, which is really fast to run, and delaying only the complex um, acceptance changes to the already existing test harness built on BATS. This will also help to improve not only the, the, the speed of these builds, but also the capability to, to add more security because CST does not need Docker engine for most of the tests that it describes. And by doing this, we could also build Docker images without a Docker engine, allowing the build to be moved on Kubernetes cluster. So it should build faster with more agent that could be provided and no need to maintain and ensure that no build are concurrent. We could have concurrent build without any risk for that. Uh, finally, uh, we have two ideas that are completely exploratory, but we will, I want to mention them. If we have to maintain all these dimensional builds, maybe the Docker file is not the correct tool for that job. Packer is able to build images and we could use utilize Packer to maintain that matrix in the future. Uh, Packer, uh, Cara is currently experimenting on a draft pull request. It's a proof of concept. It's not aimed to be productized, but still it's interesting. Uh, as experiment. Second element, a Docker file generator ID. That's a, a project we might want to add to the GSOC with Cara. The idea will be a um, contributor will go on the Jenkins website on the Docker page and have a form. So you select, I want the Docker image for an agent or a controller. I want that base operating system, Windows, Alpine, Debian, whatever. Then I want GDK 8, 11, maybe 15 in the future. And then I also want to customize with the following supported tools on that list. So you have a list, let's say Terraform, Golang, whatever. And then you click on uh, I want this. And the local JavaScript on your web browser generate a Docker file. It's completely static, does not need a backend or a database. It's only built on file system. And it produced the recipe, the Docker file recipe that say, okay, we recommend you to build your image with that template, with fixed version, eventually checksum, and the database will be a, a JSON file answered with this, all the HTML files. So we could totally use that as a static service, and that could be a great idea to provide a service to the community, because. The idea here will be to provide a recipe and not the cooked meal for the community because a cooked meal can be ripe if we keep it as it's outside fridge during months. That's the same for a Docker image. While providing a generator of recipes, anyone can cook and maintain and eat their own meal when they want, but the recipe could be shared as a service. But yeah, just, just to clarify here, um, the consider alternate ways to maintain those images are just suggestions. And if the community want to participate with those, that would be nice. But from an infrastructure standpoint, um, we don't have any plan to spend too much time on those. So it's more like um, ideas that we have that we are exp exploring. But it's definitely, I mean, I don't think um, that the Jenkins Infra project should focus building Jenkins agent for the community um, because that's definitely a complex um, situation. And the, the, I mean, yeah, just want to explain why, why it's challenging to build the Jenkins image here is because the Jenkins project built the inbound agent. So we have a small Docker image containing the, gene, the, the inbound agent that can establish a connection with a controller. Um, because we also use image on uh, Maven, Ruby, Python, and those images, we had the choice to either either maintain our own image and manage ourselves the way we install Maven, the way we install Python, the way we install Ruby, or we decided, but that's basically what we did. We just said um, the Ruby, we're going to use the upstream Ruby Docker image. The Python, we are going to use the upstream Python Docker image. But because we don't control the ways those images, some image use Alpine, some image use Debian, some image use CentOS. And because in our case, we want to have those inbound agent with a Jenkins user, which means that um, 
based on the operating system, we have different ways to create the user, for instance. And that's that's where the challenge come. And based on the, the version of Java, um, I mean, there, there, that's why that's what um, Damien explained with the matrix, um, matrix of a Docker file. But again, um, yeah, that's we have to see how how we can use it. But yeah, that's that's definitely challenging. So that's why we had that discussion. Should we build inbound agent for different, I would say, tools for the community, or, or do we just build them for um, the Jenkins Infra project? Because obviously, building them for the Jenkins Infra project mean that we build them. If we want to deprecate, it's a decision on our side. But on the other side, once we push and publish an image on the Jenkins um, Docker Hub organization, then people assume that we are shipping those and that we are maintaining those images, which is not necessarily the case. So if you are interested to maintain those images, uh, we would like we would like to put in place a the, um, the person in the code owner to really identify who's responsible to build those image, maybe just one image. If you're interested to just build a Python, that's fine as well. But we definitely have to clean up um, and to simplify those inbound in agents. Um, that's why we are working just, on this at the moment. Just a side note regarding the Jenkins Infra project, that problem will be solved in a different way as soon as we will be able to switch to Kubernetes agents. Because with the concept of the pod with multi-container, you only need highly specialized Docker container and you don't need this image anymore. So as soon as any Jenkins infra jobs that are using these images is switched to Kubernetes-based agents, we won't have to maintain these images for our own and use it on our own infrastructure. And that should be a good indicator of our work. Um, technically, we'll do because one of the issues we had, for instance, was with the Maven Docker image, which is running as root by default and running Jenkins test as root fails at some point. Um, so that's how it started, basically. So you need to be sure that if you're using Maven, you're using Maven with a different user than root. I had the issue um, while working and testing Which can Jenkins. totally be provided through parent templates for the Kubernetes agent. So we can provide these rules uh, or on the pipeline library or parent templates. But the goal will be to get rid of these images. That could be a good indicator of simplification of the tooling we are using. Yep. For but, us. Yeah, I prepared to to quickly finish because we spent, uh, we are almost, we are over the time for the meeting. And I would like just to quickly finish. Um, in terms of release, we had the weekly release today. Everything went well. Um, I'm not sure if Mark already published a GitHub change log. Um, yes, you did. That's awesome. We have an ATS release coming tomorrow. And the last topic before we close this meeting, um, which is about Oracle Cloud. Uh, have you created that, that account yet? Or is it still, so you created that account? Do you need some help to deploy Mirror? Yes, but I think yes, given, I given the pending infrastructure changes, we should look for that maybe next week, not this week. Let's, let's let this Oracle experiment wait another week, if that's okay. Um, I will, uh, if you have some time on Friday, I would. I would oh, okay, all right. On Friday. Great, okay. Yeah, sure. Because uh, basically what I fear is if once you start the account, um, the time that we can use under the sponsoring program reduce. And uh, we always have excuse to delay work. So let's take a date and fix to that date. Great. All right. So I'll, I'll schedule some time with you for Friday. Awesome. Um, then thank you for participating to this infra meeting. And I propose to stop here and continue the discussion in, our, in RC, basically. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.